Welcome back, everyone. So in part two, we're going to be talking about defibrillation as well as some other procedures that we can consider when managing patients with refractory ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. So as all of us know, the standard of care is to deliver defibrillation for patients with recurrent uh, arrhythmias, especially ventricular arrhythmias. Um, unfortunately, in patients with refractory cases, you've tried this multiple times and it's just not working. So what are some of the other things that you can consider for resuscitation with these patients? One thing to consider is a vector change defibrillation. So this is essentially you switching the position of your defibrillator pads. So if you've been shocking the patient in an anterior lateral approach, you just take the pads and switch it over to an anterior posterior approach. And the thought behind this is that by switching the way in which you are delivering electricity through the chest, you're actually going to hit more portions of that left ventricle and thereby increasing the likelihood of a successful defibrillation. You're increasing essentially the entire voltage gradient throughout the heart, making your shock deliveries potentially more successful. Another thing to consider here is double sequential defibrillation. So this has become more popular recently. There is recent literature that, you know, potentially supports its use. What you're going to be doing here is you're going to be taking two defibrillators. You're going to be charging each of them to 200 joules, and then you're going to deliver a rapid sequential shock. So you shock the patient with the first defibrillator. There's a very short pause of less than a second, followed by a second shock. So by doing this, you are delivering high amounts of energy and you are essentially going to decrease the defibrillation threshold. So the thought process behind this is by delivering that first shock, you are making the second shock more likely to be successful. And then again, there is also the theory of multiple vectors, right? You are applying pads to different areas of the chest, so you're going to be hitting different areas of the heart, thereby increasing your chance of success. And then the one important thing to remember here is that you want to keep your defibrillator pads separate, right? If they are touching and you deliver electricity, this can significantly damage your equipment and it might not be, uh, be able to be used anymore. So the dose VF trial is probably the best evidence we have right now um, to support the use of double sequential defibrillation. So. In this study, the, um, the authors looked at patients with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest who were in refractory ventricular fibrillation, and they applied one of three strategies. They either deliver a standard single defibrillation, they performed a vector change defibrillation, or they performed double sequential external fibrillation. And the results were actually very promising. They found that patients who either received vector change or double sequential defibrillation had a higher rate of survival to hospital discharge. The termination of uh, ventricular fibrillation was much quicker. They had higher rates of ROS. And only the patients who received double sequential defibrillation had, a, had improved neurological outcomes with a modified ranking score of less than two. Now, this study wasn't perfect. There was definitely some issues with it, um, especially the fact that it, it um, was stopped early due to COVID-19. But again, the results were statistically significant. They are very promising. And it's definitely something to consider in your refractory cases. All right, let's talk about stellate ganglion block. So the stellate ganglion block is a fascial plane block that can be performed at the bedside under ultrasound guidance. So the sympathetic nerve fibers that are innervating your your brain, your neck, your heart, run parallel to the trachea with a stellate ganglion located around the C6, C7 vertebral level. The thought is that by delivering a local anesthetic to this region, you're going to be interrupting sympathetic flow, thereby decreasing the chance of recurrent arrhythmias. You can perform this block either on the right or the left side, but it is recommended you, you start with a left-sided approach as that left stellate ganglion is actually what's most dominant at the left ventricle and potentially could be more successful. So you don't need much equipment to perform this. So you'll need um, a point of care ultrasound. You'll need some equipment to clean the skin. 
a 10 cc syringe with a blunt drawing needle. You're going to need 20 to 22 gauge needle. If you have um, ultrasound guided needles, it's even better. About five cc's of 2% lidocaine is sufficient. And then use your linear probe in order to get the best image possible. So when performing the procedure, the first thing you want to do is you want to identify your anatomical landmarks. So you're going to start by placing the ultrasound over the anterior neck around the cricoid cartilage, and you're going to come down until you see your thyroid gland. Once you find the thyroid gland, you're going to move laterally about an inch, and then you'll be able to see the carotid artery, the internal jugular vein. Just posterior to that carotid artery is going to be the stellate ganglion, the, the sympathetic chain, essentially. And then right below that, Posterior to it is going to be the long coli muscle. This is going to be your target. So when inserting your needle, you're going to be going in an in-plane approach, moving from a lateral to a medial area. So you can see on the top right here that the needle is coming in from the right side of the screen, and you're going to be targeting this sympathetic chain that's in yellow here and you're going to be delivering the local anesthetic to that area. When you deliver the anesthetic, that fascial plane is going to spread out, and it's, the lidocaine is going to be touching both your stellate ganglion and your sympathetic nerve fibers, thereby interrupting that sympathetic flow. And then finally, think about venoarterial ECMO. So Remember that there is a lot of resources that, you know, need to be figured out when um, initiating this. So you want to activate this as early as possible, especially if, you're, if your facility has the capability of doing it. VA ECMO is going to restore systemic circulation and, you know, give you time to continue doing your other interventions, such as administration of antiarrhythmics. This is a bridge therapy. So this is going to keep your patients alive until they can go for either a cardiac catheterization or a cardiac ablation or receive some other form of definitive therapy. And in the, e in the ED, we can actually initiate the process by cannulating the femoral arteries for an arterial line and cannulating either the internal jugular vein or the femoral vein uh, with a triple, triple lumen catheter. And then these can be upsized to ECMO catheters down the road. All right, and then just to sum things up, so a standard approach that you can take when uh, treating patients with refractory VTVF is you can start with your standard defibrillation. If these shocks have failed times two or times three, you can consider doing a vector change defibrillation or go immediately to a double sequential defibrillation. Other things to consider while resuscitating these patients is a stellate ganglion block. This is definitely within our scope of practice. You do not need a lot of equipment and can be done quickly at the bedside um, using ultrasound guidance. And then if your facility has the, um, the capability for VA ECMO, definitely consider getting your consultants involved as early as possible.